On behalf of Namida Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World. Our magazine partner for this series is The Week: Journalism with a Human Touch. Our session today: the extraordinary epoch of Nana Sahib Peshwa, Uday Kulkarni, in conversation with William Dalrymple. The mid-eighteenth century marks a pivotal turning point in Indian as well as world history. Historian and writer Uday Kulkarni's latest. The extraordinary epoch of Nana Sahib Peshwa charts the power struggle which led to the Marathas becoming a paramount power in India during this period. In a conversation with historian William Dalrymple, Kulkarni explores the events of the time and the power wielded by Nana Sahib Peshwa. Uday S. Kulkarni is an alumni of Armed Forces Medical College and a practicing surgeon in Pune in India. He served in the Indian Navy. and retired in the rank of surgeon commander he has written over five non-fiction books on the 18th century indian history over the last 9 years primarily relating to the maratha empire william dalrymple is the best selling author of over 10 books of fiction or 10 books of non-fiction including his latest blockbuster kohinoor the anarchy the relentless rise of the east india company and forgotten masters indian painting for the east india company William Dalrymple is also co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival. As all of you know, all our sessions that have been broadcast till now, including the ones from JLF USA and Canada, are available on our Facebook page JLF Lit Fest and on our YouTube channel Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Please do remember to ask <clears throat> questions and comment by typing it into the comment section below. Ladies and gentlemen. the extraordinary epoch of nana sahib peshwa uday kulkarni in conversation with william dalrymple william uday over to you thanks so much sanjoy uh, uday welcome it's uh, we've much enjoyed having you at the real jaipur lit festival and 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 it's a great pleasure and a privilege to have you here at brave new world uh, online um Uday I should say up front is an old and close friend of mine we have gone scrambling over maratha hill forts and uh, trekked around the deccan in his fantastic beaten up old car and uh, got stuck up uh, up difficult roads and uh, bumped over um, all sorts of obstacles and and had all sorts of fun writing our different books together he's also been enormously generous to me as a a, a fact checker uh, on the anarchy and, and saved my Uh, saved me from many a blush uh, with uh, with last minute corrections for which many thanks today um he is also puts us all to shame just by his sheer uh, prolific output of uh, uh, of history he wrote a wonderful book on james wales the uh, british uh, portraitist who, uh, who who went to the uh, pune uh, darbar only last year and now a year later we have this enormous fat book on nana sahib uh published uh, which is uh, the fruit of lockdown this is the we have covid i think partly to thank for uday's amazing uh, ability to cook that's how many how many words how many pages this is 598 pages of prose uh in less than 9 months after james wales so something good has come out of covid um i'm going to let uday speak for himself now uh, and give a presentation with some slides uh, he's a great photographer and a, and a, and a great uh, fan of uh, the art of the 18th century so we have some wonderful images to look forward to uh, as well as his words and then i'm going to uh, question uh, him and ask about him and his own extraordinary story as well as the story of the later uh, marathas uh, a field he has made his own so over to you today uh, i can't wait to hear what you have to say thanks a lot william and sanjoy for this introduction and it's a real honor to present my book at the jaipur literature festival online event and to present it with you william which is definitely a privilege and but because we are uh, running short of time as far as the slide show is concerned i'll just without much ado plunge straight into the story i have aim to give you a overview of what this 500 page book uh, actually has and what it tries to say and uh, it has nearly 200 characters on a nationwide scale one day you are in the karnataka the other day you are in the punjab and scores of tiny details that will eventually need to be gleaned as you can see from this rather dramatic portrayal of a confrontation in the court of aurangzeb in agra between shivaji raja and uh, aurangzeb in 1666 uh, 
and this was actually what led to the founding of the maratha par in the 17th century which uh, led to the coronation of uh, shivaji raja in 1674 and this kingdom was to last for the next century and a half if one takes 1818 to be the end but more on that later so the maratha period actually bridges the mogal the earlier mogal and bahmani period with the later british period and uh, this seems to have some way fallen between the gaps in our so called progressive education we have missed this point altogether and in many ways this is the last indigenous empire of india before 1947 after a century of war end of the 17th century and uh, the death of aurangzeb which is a watershed in indian history we find that the marathas the momentum carried them northwards and the monarch that was chhatrapati shahu the grandson of the great shivaji and bajirao peshwa who came to uh, the office of the peshwa in 1720 uh, within 12 years of aurangzeb's death a large army of 30000 maratha troops found themselves in delhi actually changing emperors they deposed farooq seher and put rafiu darjat on the throne and they also got the rights to collect the revenue of the six subahs of the deccan in the same year the next year you find bajirao coming to the uh, office of the peshwa and declaring to his sovereign that just give me the orders and i will make sure that the Uh, armies of your kingdom actually march right all the way to attack from 1720 to 1740 from a kingdom of three districts that has it gained an empire that extended from the yamuna and the chambal in the north till the tungabhadra in the south and this uh, was actually the climax of this was when bajira himself reached delhi in 1737 and uh, this was probably a cue for nadir shah to come two years later in 1739 and attack delhi in a in a very brutal raid and uh, in fact there is a stark contrast between the two because when bajira reached delhi you find one of his letters he writes to his brother he says that delhi is a mahasthal in hindi a mahasthal means a great city and i contemplated burning a few suburbs to inform the emperor that i am here but then i thought that being a great city i should not do that and that would break the cord of politics and diplomacy Two years later, of course, Nadir Shah would have none of that, and uh, we have we found that a massive slaughter and massacre and loot took place uh, in that city. And uh, contrast, I would say, the spread of the Marathas over this entire period of nearly fifty years was a very mild, was a much milder spread. You rarely find a pyramid of heads outside the victor's tent, as one sees in several other battles that were fought on the Indian subcontinent. Now, in the aftermath of Nadir Shah's raid, you find that he placed Muhammad Shah back on the throne. But for a while, there was a bit of a doubt whether he would do so. And there are letters which are available at that time which say that there was a thought that the Rana of Udaipur would probably be a replacement if Muhammad Shah is deposed. And there was a conversation going on between the Rajputs and Bajira, who was at Burhanpur, that on the strength of Maratha arms, the Rana of Udaipur should be placed on the throne of Delhi. eventually that didn't happen because mohammad shah was uh, returned to the throne and chhatrapati shahu who was the maratha ruler he also felt that there is greater merit in restoring a broken edifice which was mohammad shah's creating a new one and chhatrapati himself has no desire to occupy the throne in delhi so that put paid to any maratha hopes of uh, taking over delhi over the rest of the century in 1740 Uh, bajirao died at a fairly young age and that was a point where i start my book where the mid 18th century begins and uh, that was a uh, 19 year old boy nala saheb uh, he probably did not realize at that point that he was standing on the edge of a new epoch the mughal empire had all but vanished after the raid of nadir shah the marathas had uh, had become the strongest power in the land and uh, as if to signify this 100 years ago uh, shezwalkar who was a renowned maratha historian has written that in the history of the world a revolutionary period comes once after several centuries and in india such a time came in the mid 18th century and now was the helm of affairs at the start of this epoch so you can see that was a period of change because the mughal empire collapsed the marathas had also a change of uh, the peshwa at that point in time 
and here you find that the greater maharashtra which had been acquired during bajilao's time from gwalior in the north to tungabhadra in the south and which continued to have this maratha influence right up to 1947 that was the time after 1740 that the marathas went beyond this into newer areas therefore you find the first attacks on the karnatic uh, where trichinapalli and tanjavur was rescued from the nawab of parkat in 1740 you find the uh, dynasty of murshid kuli khan was displaced by alivardi khan who was quite frequently in those days called the usurpur and uh, there was a uh, reason for the marathas to go into bengal after that in there was a very muscular anglo french uh, rivalry which began in the karnatic and it was uh, uh, wars with the nizam several assassinations that took place in the nizam kingdom the uh, assassination of nazir shah led to the five invasions of ahmed shah abdali in a matter of 13 years in 1752 the mughal emperor was so weak that he asked for protection from the marathas and a agreement was signed to that effect so all these events were going on during this time the Ang- the english and the marathas had a, were in an alliance and actually the two armies to got together the navy the royal navy came to india and the royal navy with the maratha army actually fought together to get back the fort of vijayadurg from the angres for the peshwa just after this you find that calcutta falls to sirajuddola and i personally feel that sirajuddola could not have found a worse point in time to do the whole royal navy was here at that point in time and so these things kept happening one after the other it was a very very eventful period right up to the time 1761 when panipat happened so uh, when the maratha armies actually reached lahore in 1758 it's very significant that a letter was sent by the shah of iran to raghunath rao uh, who was the brother of nana saheb who was in lahore that the let us both attack afghanistan which was just a new born nation at that point in time and we will share the uh, region between kandar will be will go to persia and kabul will go to you and raghunath rao writes in his letter to the peshwa that 100 years back kabul and kandar were parts of the mughal empire and i don't see any reason then why we should now part with kandar and give it to the persians so that offer of the shah of persia was not taken at that point in time so you can find that there was a soaring ambition and there was a confidence in the marathas at that point in time this is what actually was the situation in 1758 59 1760 when the marathas had reached right up to peshawar atok lahore and multan and in the south they were having their power right up to tanjavur from this point in time let's move to the second part of the book which comes to the story of the karnatak where after 1740 paguji bosle and murarao gorpade the maratha adventurer from the fort of guti in the south uh, the nawab of arcot and the the politics of chanda saheb these are all names which you probably have heard in your history books and the Uh, french and the english were actually drawn into the struggle between these various components which were there at that point in time and it was actually duplace vaulting ambition that i would say awoke the sleeping east india company which had really not thought of empire at that point in time and when they lost madras and they found that they had to protect themselves that is the time they started building an army actually so officer was called from europe to build up an army for the english in the karnatak so It, this went to the siege of arcot where clive first made his name and then the battles are around trichinopoly which land up to 1755 and this abruptly ended in 1754 when you find that the french uh, company recalled duplay and that was a game changer because you don't recall a general in the middle of the battle and that's exactly what happened and the very next year you find that the royal navy came to india uh, we find that from here there were other challenges that took uh, that the uh, uh, peshwa faced and of course one of the most interesting chapters of the book are the seven or eight chapters which are devoted to bengal so 1740 when the when bengal was lost uh, to the uh, mughal emperor you find that uh, in the maharashtra puran which is quite often quoted to be one of the texts of the time mahamad shah writes to shahu that he who as a servant has killed the governor which means that he has killed the grandson of murshid kuli khan and i have no army i have no one who can bring this usurper here 
he enjoys his kingdom in bengal he has not paid me tax he is very powerful therefore you should send men there and take the south this actually precipitated the maratha invasion of bengal and when bhaskar pandit the diwan of raguji bosle reached uh, bengal he told aliwardi khan's wakil that shahu raja has sent me to say, take the south go and tell the nawab to give me south go quickly this is one of the quotes which are there in the maharashtra puran so that started a battle in the in bengal which went on for 10 long years until eventually in 1751 you find the aliwardi khan was forced to cede odisha to the uh, ruler of nagpur that is raguji bosle and give a south of 12 lakh which he continued to give for the next 6 or 7 years until the british came and took over so these were the episodes in bengal which have got a lot of minor details which are there in my book uh, again in after 1750 there were plenty of wars with the nizam because it was the intention of the peshwa to uh, take over the entire south the nizam had become very weak in fact he was propped up by busi who was the general of the french who was staying in hyderabad there was also internal strife because when chhatrapati shahu passed away in december 1749 and he had been ailing for some time he didn't have a son and the succession struggle occupied nana saheb for a full two years there were rebellions like damaji gaikwad of gujarat came right up to pune and satara when the peshwa was fighting the nizam and turaji angre who was the admiral of the maratha fleet at vijayadurg he remained defiant and would not accept the authority of the peshwa so these internal problems also were uh, something that the peshwa at that point in time had to face then you come finally to immediately after tulaja angre was taken care of you find a few months later calcutta fell to sirajuddaulah and as i said in 1755 the royal navy with capital ships under vice admiral watson the british army and their artillery regiments embarked on board an east india company army followed a little later under robert clive and they all uh, landed up in bombay and madras and the first assignment given to watson was that you have to take the the fort of giria or vijayadurg in february 1756 and of course that forms a fairly large part of my book and uh, quoting from several original documents you find that watson and his fleet went there along with clive and within a day or two or three days uh, firing on the fort they captured vijayadurg in 1756 shortly after that they lost calcutta and from madras uh, again the armada was fitted out clive with his armies embarked some of the british are from the ship and they went up the hugli and uh, it was the bombardment from the uh, hugli which actually softened uh, calcutta for uh, clive to go inside with air coot actually who was there at that time and they took the fort back from there a month or two later you find the fleet moves to chandernagore and the french are overcome chandernagore is taken 1757 and charles watson died soon after and he remains the forgotten soldier of who established the british empire in india or the foundation of the british empire in india of course in westminster abbey you have this uh, wonderful uh, plateau of uh, uh, tableau of uh, watson in the roman emperor's uh, robes and uh, you find a native of vijayadurg is uh, sitting next to him with his with, in chains and calcutta is on the on the right in the form of a lady and you find the plaque of chandernagar or one of those two uh, trees that are next to him so this of uh, what of contribution of uh, charles watson uh, during those three years and these three battles actually turned the tables and that eventually led to plassey which of course was more of a mock battle because mir jafar kind of uh, defected at the, on the battlefield but it is interesting that from clive's own correspondence you find that as late as 21st of uh, june 1757 he writes to the select committee at calcutta asking whether he should take the help of the marathas and the background to this was that nana saheb peshwa had written a letter to clive that should you need my help because they were allies at that point in time i will send 70000 soldiers under my brother to calcutta to help you of course that help was a rather uh, it was a euphemism for taking over the province himself because nana saheb always had an eye on bengal right from its very early days so all these things were happening and at the same time the marathas in delhi were engaged with the fourth invasion of ahmed shah abdali which is again which and mathura and vrindavan to such an extent that the loot that ahmed shah abdali took back to his country at that time was so much 
that uh, every animal that we could command here in Delhi was taken. There's not a washerman's donkey left behind to carry his uh, treasure of Delhi back to Kabul. So that is what the Marathas were engaged in. Soon after that, they followed uh, to Punjab and reached Atok and Peshawar. We should, I just want to take you back to a bit of Nana Saheb as a ruler. Because the second half of his reign, from 1750 to his death in 1761, you find that Nana Saheb had been to the north several times in the, the 1740s, had seen the ease of life there, the kind of life, the buildings over there, the monuments of the country. He had been to Delhi, he had met the, he had seen the people, how cultured they were, the poetry of the region and so on, the gardens of that place, the rivers, which were much bigger than the small rivers in the Deccan. And he felt that he must, his own region up to that standard. So you find that he comes back and he um, builds water supply schemes, which was, an, which was being used right up to the mid 20th century in Pune. He makes bridges. The first bridge of Pune was built by Nana Saheb and roads which connect different cities. He builds Marathas palaces uh, like the Shanwarabada and the uh, palaces of his chiefs in Pune. He tries to build an artillery by bringing uh, Europeans first. He tried to even recruit Busi for a while and even uh, the Gardis who were recruited to run the artillery. And, and he created a fresh galaxy of chiefs who could lead his armies into far-flung regions of the empire. At that point in time, you find Nana Saab is more a prime minister than a general. And as a, uh, as a prime minister, Nana Saab was the diplomat supreme, as I call it. And it is in his letters that one really finds the real Nana Saab. Now, when you come on the entire extent of the 18th century, one is basically struck by the influence the Marathas had on this entire period. Once mere tillers of the land, farmers, and uh, they adopted the martial tradition and they made inroads into province after province until they turned to be the paramount power in India. And this was the strength, this was arising from the strength that they gained from the furnace of war and that helped them create the empire. Namasa, the mid 18th century therefore was a very critical period in Indian history. It's a story that encompasses most parts of India and it's an extraordinary epoch in which Nana Saheb, you find, has participated as the biggest player of them all. The man at the helm of the Maratha state needed flexibility, he needed cunning, military power, money, he needed a strong leadership. And one finds that Nana Saheb also led his troops on campaigns, but it was not the run, uh, running pitched battles that is... It, he was the more cerebral of the Peshwas, as I call him, and he devoted ample time to intrigue and to diplomacy. And he used these to further his interest and consolidate the empire under his own authority. He built strategic alliances, fielded large armies in far-flung places. And finally, in the last year of his life, he was called upon to defend the so-called nation state of India. He could visualize the changing, ever-changing Indian political landscape. He could play rivals against rivals. He could make friends with bitter enemies. He developed appropriate instruments in his chiefs to further his policies in the far-flung regions of the empire. He, and he gave them a degree of autonomy, although he placed his own trusted men in their courts. The entrenched Mughal society, the feudal Nawabs, the feuding Rajputs, the local satraps, the rebels within his own empire, they all tried to resist him. And Nana Saheb, with his able chiefs, conquered them all until the last year of his life. Uh, taking a metaphor from the game of poker, I would say that, and the classic song, of course, Nana Saheb knew uh, when to hold his cards, when to fold them, when to walk away and when to run. And he used them as, as the situation dictated. In diplomacy, in intrigue, in planning and persuasion, Nana Saheb had no peers. It was in his letters that, as I said, you discover the real Nana Saheb. He could charm a bird out of a tree. He could reprimand an errant chief like a stern housemaster. And he also could, on occasion, cheat like a truant adolescent. As many others have remarked, he was a master strategist of the times. And to oppose Nana Saheb in his heyday, as his opponents learned, was at their peril. Now, I'm at the nearing the end of my presentation. What have I left out? I've left out a lot because I could not have covered it all. Panipat is one. And to Nana Saheb's misfortune, Panipat became his epitaph. And if, if only Nana Saheb had been in the north at that point in time, his strategic view and his diplomatic skills would have probably 
and led to a different outcome at that point in time. Uh, I feel the title of the book could not say it better. Putting all these events together, it was an extraordinary epoch led by the Peshwa at that point in time. And although the book is not a biography, one finds a stamp of Nana Sahib over all the events of the time, even before Plasi, uh, when Clive was asking whether he should ask for the Peshwa's help. And there are wheels within wheels in all these events that I have delved, in, delved into in some detail, so that the motivations of the people who were in power at that point in time understood by the reader. I will now hand over to William, and I'm sure this is the segment of today's event that not only I, but all the audience also looks forward to. So over to you, William. William, you're on mute. Apologies. I was, I was just saying that uh, it's certainly not the case that everyone's come to hear me today, that we're all big admirers of Uday and what he's achieved. And what I wanted to say first was uh, ask about you, Uday. I mean, most historians in India are academics, and those that are not academics tend to be uh, people like me who've drifted in from writing. Uh, but you have a completely different past. You are a distinguished surgeon and an ex-naval man. What made you pick up your pen? Uh, and this whole business of self-publishing that you've managed to uh, succeed in, in, in making a success. Many people would love to do the same. Maybe you could just say a little about both those things. What brought you to writing and, and what led you to self-publish? I, I wrote my first book when I was in school, actually, on a school notebook. I was living in a boarding school. And it was, nobody prompted me. It was just my interest in It was titled the Mughal Maratha Charitra. It was called the Don Darbar or the Two Darbars. So that was the title of the book. And I still have it with me. But then you know, 35 years in between when you're into medicine, you really don't have time to do it. Though all your additional reading, like I remember I sent a mail to you when I finished reading the last Mughal, complimenting you for writing a wonderful book. And when the Panipat... I remember that when we first got in contact, exactly. Yes. So when the 250th year of uh, Panipat was to be sell, was kind of to be observed in 2011, all that I had read about Panipat until then came to a boil. And I felt like something which will correct the impressions which are there in these various authors. And that led me to my first book. Now, as far as self-publishing goes, I had some experience in that because my mother had written some, had, uh, written some essays on a different subject, which I compiled in uh, about 17 years back. And I, I didn't want to go to a publisher. I just self-published. And over the next seven years, I sold a thousand copies without Flipkart and without Amazon. It was a learning experience for me. And I just did it for my mother. So when I started writing my book, I wanted it to be published on the 14th of January, 2011, which was the 250th anniversary. And there was just no time to go to a publisher where the manuscript, probably the publisher would be in Delhi and would never get published on time. So I just did it myself. And it just turned out for the better and it went off well. But in a sense, you know, it's one thing when you're starting off and you, and, and you haven't got a publisher, but now... You're one of the best-selling historians in India. You have a vast following. It would be very easy for you to pick any publisher in India or abroad. Uh, and yet you continue to do it yourself. Why is that? I enjoy composing my books and designing my books. Uh, I mean, I tried to go to a few designers when I brought out my James Wales book. and I, They gave me a few proofs, which I just couldn't agree with the design of the book. And uh, I mean, I sit next to my computer operator whenever I can. I spend three, four hours at a stretch and I compose page, especially the book like James Wales, which was full of pictures. When yeah, the beautiful pictures. book, incidentally, anyone who's interested in this, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's, it's the most, it's, it's your foreign to art history, really, isn't yes. it? Beyond history to art history. So it's, it's actually a problem that I cannot delegate work to anybody else. And I'm not satisfied with work done by others, which has kept me on. And I'm enjoying it. I mean, it's fun. But in this age of Flipkart and Amazon, are you getting the sales that you could get if you, I mean, you know, if you were represented by a major publisher, are you getting it in the bookshops and so on? I hardly deal with any bookshops nowadays because today I find mm -hmm. using Amazon and Flipkart, I can sell my book anywhere from Nagaland to Kerala. So that works better than trying to put your book into every bookshop in every city of the country. And then as a, as a, as a small publisher like myself to chase them up, after that, which is the biggest, uh, most difficult job. I mean, I don't have a staff of 10 people who can do that. So I find that Amazon and Flipkart is what actually these online, uh, whatever companies are there, they are actually 
are the ones which have enabled me to do continue doing that and if that probably stops i'd probably have to rethink the whole thing and and you'd recommend it to anyone else listening here as as a viable route to making oh, it yes. i mean can oh, you make yes. a, can you make a, a decent coverage of this i mean you can oh, yes. really make a i think i would recommend every new author to self publish because uh, uh, i mean i would i would like to say it up front that the publishing industry is not uh, transparent it is there are a lot of uh, things which uh, author doesn't come to know and i have found many of my colleagues in pune have been complaining about it that they don't really? really know what is happening at the publishers end and <clears throat> and i did, i would rather not venture into that something which i don't know because i mean a book comes every two or three years and i don't mind spending a few months getting into the nitty gritty to design it something which i enjoy sure. really now the next question is uh, when people think of the marathas they tend to focus in because of their education almost entirely on shivaji shivaji is obviously the iconic figure uh, why have you chosen to write about the later marathas and not about shivaji i have not ruled out writing about the 17th century at some point in time but i have found that the amount of material which has already been published about the 17th century is voluminous and there have been right. scholars who have been working on it for the last 100 years and by the time i catch up with what they have written and add something to that it's a it's a major undertaking uh, on the other hand i find the 18th century has been totally neglected by people who are writing about india i mean you are one of the exceptions who have written about the 18th century well i mean i read about it for that very reason that there was exactly like you that, that if I, if i had been writing about shah jahan and an akbar one would have had a mountain of people before you and, yes, and very right. little chance of finding new material while well, like you i found the 18th century to be both fascinating and unwritten and another thing was that i always had this kind of angst that Uh, the maratha empire which came between the moguls and the british has been ignored by our uh, historical uh, establishment and you find that plasi the british empire begins and the marath uh, moguls are over that kind of simplistic uh, history has been taught whether it's in schools or um, anywhere else so i wanted to change that do you feel that um it's tricky to write about shivaji I mean, shivaji now as you know in maharashtra is regarded as more or less a god and and to write about him as a human being with with failings like any other human being has is that a, is that a possible these days or, or is it something you would you would be nervous about doing well one has to be a little circumspect about it there's no doubt about it and uh, uh, i don't know what what exactly would be the response if uh, somebody would uh, uh, do it because you know people who are the people who are not always people who are well versed in history i mean Uh, you know if you write something bad about some ruler in some other part of the country because we are a very federal nation every region yeah. has got its own history suppose i criticize siraj ud daula tomorrow i might find that people in bengal are up in arms against me because for as far as today you look at siraj ud daula in a completely different light so it's difficult to really write history in the first place difficult enough to write about history in the first place but uh, to write about a very emotive person wherever whichever region he may belong to it makes the task even doubly difficult so i find the 18th century thankfully doesn't have that kind of uh, appeal <laughs> you can say you can say much more clearly what you what you think um so i mean the old imperial historians grant duff and so on tended to look on the on the marathas as sort of heroic raiders rather than as great monarchs and 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 yet and on the other pole um some of the more nationalist historians have looked on the marathas as the greatest rulers since since gupta time where do you where do you stand between those two poles i think the truth lies somewhere in between because uh, the marathas uh, were continuously at war if you see the throughout the 18th century they never had a period of peace for say five four or five decades when they could really establish themselves and have a settled administration especially outside the regions of malwa bundelkhand gujarat maharashtra nagpur odisha and parts of karnataka so beyond these regions the, there was always some kind of turmoil like you have mentioned there were around delhi a few hundred miles around delhi for the last 50 years of the 18th century there was always some kind of turmoil going on whether it's gulam qadir marching into delhi or somebody or there other was always disturbing the peace in that region yeah so a settled political system is a prerequisite for any kind of settled administration uh all said and done we still believe in a delhi centric history 
like when the indian history congress talks about the medieval history they start in 1206 and they end at 1526 now for the entire india south of the narmada these dates have no meaning right 1206 was when mah kutubuddin naibak came to delhi and 1526 was when babur came there but what is that got to do with people living south of the narmada they don't absolutely yeah um no one of the big surprises for non historians about this period is that you know the idea from bollywood and, and and so on that the marathas and the moguls were deadly enemies that they one was the nemesis of the other and yet as you said eloquently at the beginning of your talk the marathas effectively propped up the moguls uh, and acted as their protectors now why on earth did they do that what was in it for them that sweeping away the moguls and just establishing themselves instead or moving the capital to pune rather than from delhi i mean it, it, from a nationalist or bollywood perspective you you'd expect uh, uh, them to show to ride in and and just lay waste to delhi why did that not happen uh, for, for for one uh, shahu in his very young age from the age of 7 to the age of 25 was a prisoner in the mughal camp uh-huh. and he felt as if he owed his very life and the uh, chance of retaining his own faith uh, kind of he owed it to the benevolence of aurangzeb although aurangzeb did insist at one point in time that he should convert but then when he is uh, when he is uh, when aurangzeb's daughter kind of intervened and said please let him be uh, instead of shahu he said that two prominent chiefs or noblemen of the marathas must convert in in his place so till the very end shahu was just grateful to be able to live for those 18 years and he must have had many a narrow escape around that time and uh, you'll be surprised to hear that he Aurangzeb actually extracted a promise from him that he will make sure that he will not destroy the Mughal kingdom so when the nizam is defeated you find that shah writes to baji rao that let him be don't destroy him completely or when nadir shah destroys this is this is uh, outside outside bopal yes even outside bopal yeah. or at palkhed in 1728 both the battles he says let him be don't destroy him completely or when mahmud shah was deposed by nadir shah he wanted he said it's better to repair a existing structure than to build a new one so let him be and put him back on the throne so that was the attitude and that became a habit now the moguls had become so weak by that time in delhi when your king doesn't have the desire to go to delhi and rule from there your base is far in the south in pune the population of delhi at that point time was such that a maratha king could not have gone and stayed there and said of course this is my interpretation of it and the mughals were already so weak the wazir was a creature of the marathas and they could get him to do what emperor of course had lost all power after uh, mahmud shah's reign was over even during mahmud shah for that matter so they could get what they wanted so it was as if the mughals reigned but the marathas ruled and a similar pattern was followed by the british later on after they took over delhi they kept shah alam the second in his place and they gave him all the honors for the another 50 years before finally they decided decided to depose him i mean do you think i mean this is three three questions about mis- i mean we're running out of time but three things that you could point out as mistakes uh, uh, uh strategic mistakes one not getting rid of the moguls two allying with the east india company rather than resolutely opposing them constantly because they did have several alliances with with the company and thirdly i mean do you feel that nana saab has to take responsibility for panipat it was a major defeat under his watch actually the first point about uh, the moguls was not such a big issue because uh, right up to the year 1803 you find that the mughal king was actually a subject to mahaji shinde and the and dalatra shinde's dictates So he was not really kind of opposing them in any way. He was just allowed to be. So it did not affect them in any way. In fact, it allowed them to not let somebody else take over the throne of Delhi and becoming a nuisance, because the Mughals by that time had become so weak uh, that they could not have opposed them. And as long as they did not displace them, and another one doesn't take their place, as the Rohilas for a long time tried to do, or as Gulam Kader tried to do, which would have been a bigger adversary than the present state the Mughals were in. so that was one point as far as the alliance with east india company was there is a letter in 1739 by chatrapati shahu which i have quoted in my book on bajji rao in fact a copy of it is in the british library in london which i have printed Absolutely. where he says yeah. that of all the topicers of all the people hat hat wearing people the english are the most honest and the most trustworthy 
That's what he says in 1739. I hope he's not opposing that to the Scots. <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of thing continued for the next 20 years. It was only in 1759 when the English kind of deceived Nana Sahib and grabbed Surat. Well, both of them had gone there in alliance. When they grabbed Surat, that is a time when the kind of the scales fell off and they started seeing them in their true light. And Nana Fadnis realizes that the company is a big threat. He stitches together the triple alliance. Much later, much but, later. I'm yeah, talking about 17th, later. I'm talking about 1750s. So, I'm saying, do you think it was? A, do you think one can point this as as, as major errors of Nabisab, that He didn't uh, eliminate think, the company I when think, he could, and he didn't eliminate the the Mughal. The, the, sur the surprising part is the difference in the treatment to the Portuguese and the English. When Bajirao and Chimaji Appa, his brother, they found that the Portuguese are Delhi uh, are kind of uh, indulging in religious operation of India. They got rid of the Portuguese from Daman till Bombay. And they got rid of the Siddhi from Bombay right, right down up to beyond Jajira. Leaving only is the that why Batai is now deserted? Was that because of the Marathas? When you go to those wonderful Portuguese convents and things just yeah. north of Bombay. So all those, was that were taken, all those were taken over by the Marathas in 1737. And they remained with the Marathas for another 37 years until the English grabbed them in 1774. So the people who are kind of oppressing the people, either it's religious persecution or whatever, they were the people who were attacked by the Marathas. But when the Marathas took Salset and Vasai, which from the Portuguese, the people in Bombay were worried that what are the Marathas up to? And therefore, yeah. you find in 1739, the English sent an embassy to Shahu in Satara and to Bajira in Pune to ask them what their intentions are. They start strengthening their defenses to face Bandra because they were worried that from Bandra to come across to the Bombay island was a very short distance away. Oh, so, yeah. But the Marathas no intention of one, they were a good portal for trade from the hinterland. The material was sold to the English to other places and they got good value for money. And they were not oppressing the people, whether by religious means or anything else. They were just traders and they continued to be honest traders. So as I said, it was... So final trade. question, we have, we've got literally, I think, two minutes before we run yeah. out, but shouldn't uh, Nana Saab take some responsibility for, the, for, for Panipat? He, he was in the south, he wasn't in the north, he didn't supervise. And it was, I mean, Panipat, as you show in your other book, you know, it wasn't, there's nothing inevitable about the defeat. It could easily, with a different general, yes. have gone a different way. Yes. Now, the, uh, the failures in Panipat are on multiple levels. One is the diplomatic level on which this could have been averted. Had Nala Sahib been there with a subtle diplomacy and diplomatic touch rather than the headstrong Sadashi Rao Bhav who led the battle there. Kind of, the fact, uh, for example, you get the Naga Sadhus like uh, Himat Bahadur fighting with yes. the Mug with the Afghans against Marathas, again were, against all modern then, sensibilities. Yeah, but they were always part of Shuja Udala's uh, army. I mean, they were very loyal to him, fiercely loyal to him. And as you and this is one another example which says that the Rajputs did not join the Marathas at Panipat. Suraj Jat did not join the Marathas. So the Marathas had to fight the battle on, on their own. And in fact, it was not inevitable that the battle would be fought. It could have been probably avoided had the had diplomacy. There were one or two characters, like Najib Uddawla was one, who insisted that battle would take place. Even a week before the battle, there were negotiations going on that perhaps we would settle some kind of a boundary and avert this kind of a battle. And everybody was agreeable to that, except for Najib Uddawla, who insisted that we must fight the battle and remove this thorn from north, northern India, as he called it. So, of course, Nala Sahib's diplomatic touch that, think... But Nala Sahib was very sick at that time. He could not have come to the north. Did this kill him? This is my last question before we have to go. No, I no, think, no. Uh... It didn't kill him. He was already suffering from some form of tuberculosis because we have him weighing himself for, uh, you know, against gold, for donating gold to the people. And you find that he lost, uh, probably his weight was 180 pounds, which came down to 130 Oof. pounds in the matter of two years. So he had, in the end, he was almost skin and bones. So the mental shock cannot kill a person. It was a physical, probably a physical ailment, probably some kind of tuberculosis, which eventually killed him. Thank you so much, Uday. You're a great example for us all out there of industry and uh, an application. <laughs> we, we look at you with great admiration. Thank you. I hope I've uh, satisfactorily uh, dealt, with the pro dealt with the subject. It's a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you so much, uh, Uday Kulkarni, William Dalrymple. It was absolutely brilliant. We've got questions that have streamed in, but unfortunately, we decided we weren't able to send them out to you. 
maybe we can send them to you separately Uday, and you can reply to them and we will post them back on our sure. uh, website. Uh, thank you all for watching. And like I said, apologies for not being able to take your questions because of time. It was such a fascinating session that we didn't want to break uh, the, uh, the conversation between Uday Kulkarni and William Dalrymple. Please do log back on for our next session. The Dioliwala, Joyma and Dilip D'Souza in conversation with Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Uh, this is about the internment of 3,000 Chinese Indians following the Sino-India War of 1962. It's a story not known to many in a disused World War II prisoner of war, war camp in the Oli Rajasthan. Indian citizens of Chinese descent were locked away for five years. Uh, Joy Ma and Dilip D'Souza will be in conversation with celebrated author and member of parliament Shashi Tharoor. It's at 8.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 3 p.m. Uh, Greenwich Meridian Time and 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, see you soon. Thank you.